Now, I've heard a lot about the rain in the tent. Yes. And Skip Manley, the rain pooling in the surface, surface of the tent. That happened about two nights before we opened. Deluge. Guthrie, wearing a, an ancient bathing suit and a, one of those Scott's Emulsion yellow slickers, you know, wandering around and the Skip stabbing the, the pots of, of water as they came. And uh, right up, and we were trying to do a, 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 a rehearsal. And so Guthrie, he had a knife and <coughs> was cutting the ceiling of the tent. Yeah. The water pours into the auditorium. Yeah. Yes. And does someone sew the tent back together the next day? Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. My God. But he was a tent master from the circus. You know, he knew what he was doing. And wouldn't. And, and Guth, Guthrie stepped out of his. Uh, bathing costume, as he would call it. And he walked around with his slicker, naturally, but he, we knew he was nude underneath and he just couldn't be bothered picking it back up. How long was his slicker? Long enough. Knee length? Oh, below the knee. Oh, below the knee. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we have all kinds of stories. There was a, the uh, coronation of Richard III had a choir and uh, the, they were uh, little boys, male choir, male, they were 10 years old, led by two little five-year-olds. And naturally, they, they were down in the depths, you know, where the, uh, well, I don't know what they call them, but it's the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And w w two of the little kids got, got lost, and, and, and Guthrie said, and I can't, couldn't believe this, oh, for God, you're behaving like five-year-olds. And they were. And then in, in Alt's Old It Ends Well, um, we wondered how long it would take before Guthrie, who was profane, you know, like most theater people are, would say the F word. And he picked a day when we were doing a scene, the party scene, celebrating Alec Guinness's recovery from a fistula. He, he played the king who was ill at the beginning of the play. And then he gets cured. And we all have a party. And, and we, they imported the local United Church choir to be part. First of all, they could sing, and then they could be part of the thing. And we thought, is this the day? And it was. Guthrie came tearing down from the back of the theater, saying, no, 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 you're being so effing Ontario. And we looked and looked at the shocked faces of the choir, except for two women who never stopped smiling and realized that they'd never ever heard that word in their lives. Oh my God, wow. So when the theater finished its five week run, yeah. did people- Guthrie went off to Israel to do a production of The Merchant of Venice, which is very daring because, you know, let's face it, except for a couple of speeches, it's a pretty anti-Semitic play. And I said to Guthrie, who's going to play Shylock, Barry Fitzgerald? <laughs> <laughs> and he left, and, and uh, I went to the Bristol Old Vic. And, uh, but at the end of the five weeks run, did, what was the feeling? Did people know they were in a big, wonderful new success that would, would go on? Or? Well, we knew that was going to go on next year. Right. Was there an announcement made to the company that there are sufficient funds to have a second season, or how did that work? Yeah, they, 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 it didn't happen right away, I don't think, no. They, we just had a party. We made fun of, uh, I, did, I did a takeoff on uh, All's Well That Ends Richard, you know, and I got s solidly criticized for it by certain people for being uh, lacking, uh, I don't know, form. Propriety. Decorum, yeah, yeah, respect, all those things. Things that a comedian, you know, is bound to determine to ignore. Now, you have, a, you have this streak inside you of, well, the clown pulling down well, the I pants started of authority. As a and as a comedian, I mean, a comic. Right. At 10, I was, you know, looking for laughs. Dick Tater. When, when the guy, yeah, and, the, and Basil Tippett of Tippett Richardson was bald, so when I, I drew an egg, and I said, now here's a good egg, and then I would draw a basil tippet. I was always looking. 
for, for, for things like that. Where did and you I get was this? going to be an editorial cartoonist. Right. Like uh, Aislinn and, uh, and Duncan McPherson, all those guys. I, I, not in the same league. I became a cartoonist with my mouth. You were a walking, satirical Canadian cartoonist. Yeah. And, and what using something that's been done for hundreds of years. I mean, there's a, a, a malaprop comic in uh, Much Ado About Nothing called Dogberry, who talks about comparisons are odorous, you know. And I think there was one in Aristophanes 3,000 years ago. It's in, stumbling over ma making uh, mistakes in English is the oldest trick in the book. When, she, when, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he was watching a play called Our American Cousin about an American Yankee over there who makes mistakes in English. And I can't stop doing it. And have you always had malapropisms at your fingertips, or is that something you no, had to work at? No, I, I, I tried to be funny as myself in Springthaw, 48, 49, and 50. And a very wise actress called Jane Mallet, who was the reason for us doing Spring Thaw in the first place, said, you can't criticize the government at your age. They think you're a smart ass. So get a mask, get a disguise, get somebody who's older than you are. So when I came back from England in 52, and Maver Moore said, I'm going to star you. I said, star me? In what? He said, in Spring Thaw. I said, I can't sing or dance. He says, oh, God, don't I know it. But you've been away. If you've been away from the country, people think automatically that you're a star. That's what Canadians think. Oh, he must be good. He's been in the, in the States or he's been in England. So I said, what am I going to do? He said, well, I do a monologue. And I said, about what? He says, something you know something about. So I started. And what, actually, what had inspired me was I went to the Palladium to see Bernard Miles, wonderful character actor. Later, Lord Miles did the Mermaid Theater thing. He was uh, top of the bill for Lena Horne. I went to see Lena Horne, naturally. Bernard Miles came on, shuffling on as this farmer. You know, the English farmers, they have sort of smocks and floppy hats. And he was pushing an eight-foot wheel with, looks like it was full of pigeon droppings. And he came out on stage and he said, I found this. I'm going to take it home and make a ladder out of it. And I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. Because I would see people in London who were Canadian. And they would talk that funny. Because I was very aware of the way we talk. You get out and about and about, you know. So I thought, yeah. So when Maver said that, I, I thought of the 10 years before when I had avoided writing my senior matric exams by going on a farm for six months for $20 a month. And I don't think I was worth it. But I, I learned, I picked up, I was doing the thrashing gang. I got $25 a month. And I met, get to meet all the farmers, the, the hired men. And, and they didn't tell dirty jokes. They talked about family relationships. Well, she was, she was a rumble on her father's side. No, she wasn't a rumble. She was a whore, one of the Oshawa whores. And I thought, how oh, wonderful. And then when I finished the farm and went to college in 1942, I got the call, as we all did for, at the university, to come out to Saskatchewan and, and help bring in the first decent crop they'd had in 10 years. So I went out and, and I went to west of Moose Jaw, a place called Chaplin. And there was, I went in to see my farmer, he was having breakfast, bologna and boiled potatoes, sitting with his hat on and a sweater and the glasses. I thought, my God, they're franchising them. It's exactly the same that I worked for in Ontario. Wow. And that's it's, where Charlie came from. That's where Charlie came from. Charles. No, Charles was my mother's second cousin with great dignity. And What's his last name for? He looked like Victor Jory. You remember him in the movies? Yes. Wonderful look. But, uh, but his, his hired men, I mean, the, 
and I was his hired man, but the other hired guys that talk marvelous like that, you know. That's, that's the way to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Parkinson, where did the Parkinson come from? Charlie, Charles, I, I, my father-in-law was a country doctor. And when I was, um, I actually was um, vacationing up in Muskoka. Mm -hmm. and he would be on the phone and he would talk to a man called Charlie Farkerson, who happened to be the head of the Ontario Medical Association. Very distinguished surgeon. If there's a, 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 a junior high or something in the uh, Toronto area named after him, Charles E. Farkerson High. And, but I just stole his name. Like I stole this and I stole this. And I'm willing to give it to the museum. So did Charlie develop over time or did he leap full born onto the Canadian well, stage? Well, it's a gestation period of 10 years. That's like it takes an elephant that long to have a baby, you know. But did you start off, you know, just a sweater and then a couple of... Actually, I know. I started off with my, my father's suit because I was imitating the guys that went to the C&E and they always had a dark navy blue suit, too short in the legs, fairly worn, shiny, and they had the white forehead and the, and the scarlet neck and a, a hat like this. And the, I used, I'd see them going up and down the stalls with the, with the cattle and, and the horses. So that, uh, and uh, actually, the hat I wore was Lowney's Young Canada Club Indian headdress that you get if you have six bars, a hat, and a bag, all for 25 cents. And that was the hat. <laughs> like, you like those prices? And so I wore that. So th that fall was the opening of television. And, and uh, they said, Maver said, you know, you're going to do that, aren't you? And I said, we've got a, a, a mailbox, and you stand there. I said, yeah, but he wouldn't be wearing a suit. And he certainly wouldn't be wearing an Indian headdress with chocolate bar uh, advertising. So I, I'm, I'm desperate. And I go next door. I'm re rehearsing the big review. And I, I'm in a monologue and I had a couple of other sketches as myself. I was that kind of emceeing it in a way. And there are people doing a show called Uncle Chichimus, which was a puppet show. We're in Spring Thaw. We're talking about Spring Thaw, right? No, no, we're in the, starting with the first days of uh, CBC Oh, we're television. in CBC. Sorry. I'm sorry. And, and I, there's a 15-minute show, and then it finishes with Percy Saltzman doing the weather and throwing the shock up in the air and catching it. And the guy directing the show is wearing his cardigan, looked like the one that my farmer had, and the Saskatchewan farmer. And the guy's name is Norman Campbell. And I'm introduced to him by the guy who's sitting on a dolly, uh, whose name is Norman Jewison. And I knew Norman because we went to college together. So, and he's wearing this hat, which his father, Percy, used to use when he was pulling his cukes at Lafroy, Ontario. And I said, Normie, can I borrow that hat? I've got to do a thing. He said, oh, yeah. It's just, and I said, who's that? He says, that's Norman Cap. I said, can I meet him? And I said, that's a, that's a sweater. It's kind of great. He says, I, I wore that on Sable Island during the war. I said, did you get the wool off the backs of the ponies? And he laughed. And I said, can, look, I, I need a, a, co a costume next door. Can, can I, I'll, I'll bring it back. I never did. That is Norman Campbell's sweater. That is Norman Campbell's sweater. From this is Norman Jewison's father's hat. It's air conditioned. My God. The glasses I got on my own. Wow. And you know, when they did it, they used to always kid me about it, but I mean, I never did. I, I could say, oh yeah, I'll get it back to you. And when you first put on the sweater, the glasses, and the hat, did it all fall into place? Yeah, it sure did. And Charlie stepped forward. Uh huh. And hasn't stepped and back it, since. It was the day that the Boyd gang had broken out of jail. It was the first day of CBC television. And the CBC logo came on upside down. It's a great start. And um, there was a news release about the Boyd gang. So 
I think it was the next day we did the big review, and Charlie says, they tell me that some banks in Toronto was robbed by outside parties. Makes a change. <laughs> wow. Now, do you write this stuff ahead of time, or do you... I read the papers. But they then never you just step up to the mic and it comes out, or do you have to write it down? Oh, yeah. You do, you write it down. Oh, I'm terrible, yeah. Yeah. And then you learn what you've written, or you, it's a guide for you when you're up at the mic? Well, by now, I'm so old. I've been a stand-up comic for 55 years. Now I'm a sit-down comic. 